The reason you do it is not because you want to crank out as many garments to wear as possible. The reason you do it is because you want that one garment that you did crank out in three months to be freaking amazing. So, can you uh, explain to everyone who you are, what you do, um, why you're on the YouTubes? <laughs> Sure, yeah. So I go by the name V Birchwood, um, but my name is Vossi Lisa or Vossi. And I'm a daily wearer of historical fashion and historical fashion is just a huge passion of mine. And so when I got started wearing historical fashion around two years ago, I began to also really deep dive into the study of historical dress and just started doing a ton of research. And it was just something I absolutely fell in love with. And I realized, oh yeah, I could definitely wear these clothes every day. And in, along that journey, I've been finding that they're incredibly practical garments. And I've learned all sorts of different things about the reality of what it's actually like to wear historical clothes day in and day out. Yeah, I think what's really interesting when people, you know, people turn to wearing historical fashion or vintage fashion or really just any style that isn't like the norm. Um, is what they wore beforehand. Now I know you've only been wearing historical for two years or so. Um, what were you wearing before that? I mean, obviously you were wearing clothes, obviously. But <laughs> but what, what kind of style were you trendy? You were? Um, I wouldn't say I was trendy. I've never really been particularly trendy with my fashion. Mm. I think there were moments where perhaps I was a bit, like I used to have a pink velour tracksuit that I loved wearing. Um, the big reason I started is because I started to get into imperfectly doing zero waste. Um, okay. So obviously it's it's pretty hard to do it perfectly. But I, I started with zero waste and I kind of really thought about my clothes and where they come from. And so that opened up a big kind of realization for me that, you know, clothing is an incredibly mass produced industry and is probably one of our greatest contributors to things like climate issues. So I realized, yeah, historical clothes have a lot of natural fibers and also my skin is very sensitive. So I was constantly getting like rashes and things like that from the clothes I was wearing. And I kind of put two and two together and realized, oh yeah, this might be my clothes because I use natural detergent. So it's definitely not that. So it's, it's, it was just the only option. And, and once I did switch to wools and linens and cotton, I, it was so much easier to, mm -hmm. to be able to not have rashes and my skin was just much ha healthier and happier. I think that's a conversation that we don't, we don't tend to have, is that, I mean, obviously synthetic and man-made fabrics and fibers are a modern thing. Um, and that in the past you obviously use natural fibers but that there are so many benefits to wearing natural fibres. I think most people have an understanding of linen, and um, that's still very common in the summer, but things like wool used to be worn in the summer too because things are made so differently. I suppose you probably get the question quite a lot, how are you not boiling with so many layers on? Well, it's natural fibres, so you're not. Yeah, and certain natural fibers make it a little bit hotter, like silk taffeta, like I'm wearing today on this very hot yeah. day. Um, I'm actually fine, but I tend to run more cold. I have a lot more tolerance for heat as well. Um, but yeah, definitely wool, thin wool could easily be worn in the summer, and it actually really helps to protect your skin from harsh UV rays. And also it has natural antimicrobial pro properties. So because of that, it kind of helps to keep you less stinky. Because, you know, obviously with sweat, we get body odor and then it leads to smell. Yeah. And so it helps to reduce the natural odors that we all produce, um, which is great. And if you think during history before, before deodorant existed, this would have been extremely beneficial. Not to mention they would have had a linen shift on and then yeah. linen stays and they would have had so many layers of linen to also help protect their skin and keep it yeah. less smelly, I guess. If you've only just started wearing historical dress two years ago and before that you dressed quote unquote modern, what was your style like? How would you have described that before? Yeah, so when I was 12 or 13, I had an emo phase. Oh, we all had the emo phase. <laughs> yeah, so I, I did like the combat boots. My entire closet was black. Um, I went through a phase where I only wore business suits, like pants suits. That's an interesting phase. Didn't go through that phase myself, but um, you can share photos with me later. 
I don't even know if I have any, but I was just starting university when I was 16 and um, I, I wanted to be taken more seriously because I was two years younger than everyone. And then also I had a phase where I was wearing a lot of Victorian and Vo Victoriana clothing. So for instance, I would wear a lot of yoke blouses, ruffle blouses, things like that, which I really enjoyed. Um, but I always kind of had like a little bit of a historically inspired thing to my wardrobe, I would say. Even when I was kind of wearing emo stuff, I would sort of go with like black, kind of Victoriana emo stuff. Yeah. I think that's always the way it goes. Anyone that ends up in historical, though, you, if you look at the past, there's always little glimpses of it, little glimmers where you go, oh, okay, that, that now makes sense, even though you might not have seen it coming when you were 12. Um, what was the catalyst, really, for you finally deciding, okay, I'm going to leave my jeans behind and start sewing my own wardrobe and making it historical? Um, with regards to jeans, I never really wore them, but um, yeah, I, I just never found them comfortable. Like, I understand they're super comfortable for some people, but I've never found them to be. Um, but yeah, the, the big catalyst was, one, environmental reasons, because um, I was always pretty environmentally conscious, but then, of course, I decided to go the next level. The second was having stable income. Um, you know, when I started working, like, a good job and everything, I was able to actually afford natural fibers and things because there are some ways to get it can be expensive yeah and, and there are some ways to, to to kind of ditch fast fashion on a budget but um, you know I do think that it's much easier if you have the financial means and then also studying Russian literature so I have a, a bachelor's degree in Russian and I was just constantly looking at the portraits and things like that and a lot of the Russian realists were around the 1800s, so I was constantly seeing pictures of them and their wives and, you know, different paintings of the era. And I just thought, oh yeah, I love these clothes. I've always loved these clothes. I should just go for it. Why, why, did, the, why did you then go, okay, I'm gonna do it myself? Was it because it, you know, some people, some people, uh, words are not easy to say. Some people choose to hand sew their wardrobe because they want to perhaps feel close to the time period, uh, because it's environmentally a little bit better, ethically, um, or you just want to sew. What, what was that reason for, for deciding to then go, okay, I'm gonna do it myself? So um, when I was living in Iceland, because um, I only came to the UK like way less than a year ago. So because of that, I really couldn't start sewing until I was in a place where fabric was cheaper and more readily available. It's incredibly expensive to buy craft supplies in Iceland. I was going to start sewing when I was living there, but I couldn't actually start until I came to the UK and you know actually was able to get the supplies I needed and things. And luckily in the UK, it's fabric is really affordable. It's, it's, it's just like with the US, it's, it's comparable in regards to price. Mm. I suppose then we should probably talk about what it's actually like wearing historical fashion every day. What misconceptions or preconceived conceptions really are you met with from people when you go, this is what I wear? I would say that in general, people are quite kind to me and supportive, especially on the YouTube channel. People are really nice. They're like, wow, this is really inspiring. Or now you've encouraged me to wear the clothes I've always wanted to. So th that makes it all worth it. So when anyone finds out that you wear historical dress or that anyone wears historical dress every day, there's gonna be some questions that get asked. So let's go through them a little bit. Does it take you forever to get dressed in the morning? If you go to my channel, I did the Carolina Jabrowska speedrun challenge where I got dressed in my normal everyday Georgian clothes. And I did it in three minutes and 51 seconds. Yes, it was high stress. I like to make it more meditative and, you know, take my time with it in the morning. But if I could do it on camera in under four minutes, that just goes to show. And I'm not even, I'm not even having someone dress me. I'm dressing myself. Obviously upper class women would have had someone to dress them, so it probably would have been even quicker. Yeah, there are layers, but you get used to putting them on, so it becomes second nature for you, and it becomes fun. It's, it's like a routine of stability. 
When I was having severe mental health challenges, the thing that really kept me going every day was getting dressed in historical clothing because it was yeah. that familiarity. Yeah, it was it was it was tangible. It was familiar. It helped ground me into reality. You know, when I was having episodes where I was derealized a lot in my mind and such, it was really important for me to have that foundation because I suffer from obsessive compulsive disorder, and part of that is dissociating a lot because your body is constantly in that fight or flight mode. And so when when I was at my worst, having historical clothes, I think helped me get my life back. And it, that's why I'm so connected to it still is it's it's so much deeper than it just being clothes. It's it's wearing walking art. It's a, it's an expression of creativity and it's something that we can have that reminds us that we are humans putting on clothes that puts you into your body again. You know? Beautifully. Thank you. Um, ben, uh, I, I know that lots of people have spoken about this online to correct all the myths. Um, how do you go to the toilet? Like any other person. <laughs> so it depends on your century and your decade. Yeah. And how many skirts you're wearing. <laughs> yes. In the 18th century, um, you would not be wearing underwear. You would just have a shift and you would have lots of petticoats, so it was modest. It, you're not going to be flashing anyone. Your, your petticoats are also pretty long. Um, so you would kind of just hike up your skirts and go in a chamber pot or a privy. Uh, nowadays, we have these things called toilets, which... They're amazing! You should try yeah. them sometime. <laughs> they have seats. They're, they're pretty cool. Um, but yeah, and then if you go into 19th century, you already start to get things later on, like combinations, which are basically split at the crotch. So you can, again, access. access your areas to be able to use the bathroom. Um, and then you also had split crotch drawers, which are the same as combinations, except like a pant form of it. Um, so for me personally, I sometimes wear those. Sometimes I wear underwear if I'm in, in the mood to wear underwear, because sometimes I, I prefer it. Um, it's so personal. Every single person will wear slightly different undergarments. Um, which is great, you know, we all tailor our historical fashion wearing experience to our own preferences and that, those preferences might change day to day as well. Um, there's also, um, I know you don't tend to wear crinoline cages or bustle pads, uh, you know, bustles themselves uh, very often, but, uh, you know, are you able to sit on a chair properly and get in a car properly and walk around the house? <laughs> Oh yeah, I've, I've driven and been in cars with petticoats and corsets for years. I mean, it's if anything, it's easier because your back doesn't get tired driving. So you, you kind of also are in more of like an upright position. So it just makes it easier to see what's going on. You're a lot more alert, I think, and aware of, of what, you're, what you're doing while you're driving as well, because you're not just kind of zoning out because as you start to, your, your corset reminds you that that you're driving and then you're like, oh, okay, I'm driving, I need to focus. Um, so in a way, I think it actually might keep people safer. I mean, I'm not a scientist, so I, I'm not saying this as a fact, don't quote me, but you know, I think for me personally, it makes me feel a lot more aware of what's going on around me. And it's not painful, it's not rigid or stiff in the sense of, you know, every time I slouch, it hurts my back. No, I can relax quite well in them. I can take a nap in them. I can do yoga in my corset. I can lift different heavy things in my corset. In fact, probably better than I could without one. And I think that's part of why women wore them for centuries. So how did you learn about historical garments? And then how did you learn actually how to sew? So I learned about historical garments through literature and through self-research. I was in university, so I could easily have access to these various study databases, and I just started diving into it. I also started watching, obviously, like Abby Cox and Nicole Rudolph, and all of these different really reputable historical fashion people, people in the community. With regards to hand sewing, I really just did research online, so I'm all self-taught, um, and then in turn, I wanted to provide information for other people as well. And I tried to, with my videos, fill gaps in the market. So for instance, I couldn't really find a historical essential hand sewing stitches video anywhere. 
like just in one video, what are the, the seven essential hand sewing stitches that if you're gonna sew a historical garment, you need to learn these seven stitches. And so I made one. And that's because I, for coming from the experience of learning to sew myself, I knew what I was missing in regards to what was out there and what wasn't out there. And it gave me a very clear idea on what people needed. And the reason I hand sew, by the way, is not to be historically accurate. It's because I've never enjoyed sewing with a machine. Sewing by hand is very therapeutic and incredibly, it makes you feel really proud when you finish a project. The reason you do it is not because you wanna crank out as many garments to wear as possible. The reason you do it is because you want that one garment that you did crank out in three months to be freaking amazing and be so proud of the fact that you're wearing walking art. I wanted to be super connected to art all the time because I, I knew my whole life that art was the thing that fulfilled me. And so I wanted to just make my whole life about art in some way, shape or form. So to wrap up, what would you, what would your advice be to someone who wants to get into the community, wants to start wearing historical or uh, sewing their own historical garments? Where should they start and what, what are your words of wisdom and advice? So with regards to wearing it, if you're not feeling confident about wearing historical clothing, I say that you should just either jump into it and go for it or take it in increments. Start out by wearing a crazy hat or by wearing a big long skirt or something simple. I actually just released a video on this and it's all about how to wear historical clothing in public and how to deal with criticism and manage just all the comments you're going to get and have the confidence to be able to do so. If you're not able to find your community in person, then find it online and just never stop seeking community because it is there somewhere for you. So, thank you. And how, how can people find you on the interwebs? If you'd like to find my channel, I am at V Birchwood. So if you go on YouTube and you just search in V Birchwood, you'll be able to find my page. And on Instagram, I'm at Vossi Official. So that's also where I sometimes post updates. A lot of it is kind of crossover. You know, you can only create so much content in a week, but yeah. So if you want to find me, you can learn more at those channels. Huh?